Swaganin is our, the, our Ojibwe Mawin name, okay? And Bujou is French for welcome. And Lac du Flambeau, if you look at it, is Lake of the Torches. And it got its name from the French explorers that when they came on to the uh, northern Wisconsin during spring spawning season, um, a lot of tribal members would be out harvesting walleye in a canoe with a spear and a torch. So that's why we got uh, Lac de Flambeau, uh, which is uh, Lake of the Torches. And through the years, you know, we've been exercising our treaty rights uh, off reservation um, as well as on reservation um, in terms of the 1837, 1842, and the 1854 uh, treaties that were signatory to. So as, you know, just to give you a little constitutional background, you know, treaties signed are, are signed between nations and nations, all right? So, and those treaties being signed by nation to nation are protected by the U.S. Constitution when it says treaties with the United States of America are um, the supreme law of the land. So that's how we exist here within the exterior boundaries of the reservation. It's a small reservation compared to things like out in Navajo country and, you know, White Mountain Apache and some of the western tribes. But this is the only Waswaganing we have under treaty and that's the only Waswaganing we'll ever get, okay? So what we do is we have a natural resource department that provides uh, management expertise and fish culture, fisheries management, which you'll be seeing a little bit today, wildlife, conservation law enforcement, um, uh, tribal historic preservation, which is this building here, land management, water resources, we're 49% wet on the reservation. So, you know, when reservations were given out in, 19, in 1854, because of all the wetlands and water that was associated with the reservation was not really good valuable land to the U.S. government, so they gave it to the Lac Flambeau Indian the band, Lake Superior Chippewa Indians, okay? So that's why, you know, we're all, all this wet. And to be quite honest with you, right now it's a precious resource. 49% of all water, fresh water in the world is contaminated, right? So we're pretty, pretty flush with water here, okay? We could pump 5,000 gallons a minute of water if we want to, so we have very sandy soils though, okay? So, and we have a forestry program, wildlife program. We're just like a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Wisconsin DNR, except we're managing it for a subsistence hunting, fishing, and gathering opportunities for our members. And our members get a chance to hunt, fish, and gather in the ceded territories of Wisconsin on public lands within Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota. All right? But we're concentrating on this section of our little, our globe. So, um, with that, um, I welcome you again to Waswaganin. You have to sort of understand that it's maybe in the, in the scheme of things, there's 565 federally recognized tribes in the United States. Uh, there's 35 federally recognized tribes in Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, and Iowa. Okay, we have one tribe in Iowa. All right. And there's 11 federally recognized tribes in the state of Wisconsin, and we're one of those. And then there's like eight, I think, uh, eight of the 11 are Ojibwe um, nations, sovereign nations. One of the things like I indicated earlier is that we're a, gov a, a, a government within the United States of America. We're a sovereign within the United States of America. So because of those treaties, which again are constitutionally protected, all right? So what you'll be seeing today is our fish culture program, just one of those programs uh, that we do to try to raise walleye, muskie, trout, whatever we need to stock this reservation, okay? Uh, and off reservation, now we're, we're producing extended roast walleye for um, uh, Wisconsin DNR to be stocked into lakes that we spear off reservation. So um, what you'll be seeing today is a little bit more about our, our fish culture ponds and our fish hatchery. And when I get into, when we get to those spots, I'll be able to give you a little more detail about what we do and how we do it.
been in the industry for 32, and I did graduate from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point with a degree in fisheries uh, and biology. Immediately after that, I moved to Florida for nine years, and I worked for a company called Aquatic Ecosystems. Been with other companies uh, for, throughout the years, but I've been with Casco for 19, and we're an aeration company, and been doing it. Uh, this is our 50th anniversary this year. But based in Prescott, Wisconsin, which is by Hudson, right where the St. Croix and, and the Mississippi River meet. Uh, that's where our company is located. So I always throw in something about uh, where I'm from, and this happens to be Lombardi trophies. Uh, you win them if you win the Super Bowl. You don't get them if you participate. I always say this over by Minnesota because they've been there four times and they have yet to. Uh, they're not participation awards. So what gives me the right to talk? That's uh, one week's worth of uh, lanyards. Um, famous Emma is everywhere. Uh, this is two years ago at the um, yeah the, the extension uh, extension uh, National Aquaculture Extension Conference. You know, so aeration choices. There's all kinds of them, and uh, you don't have to memorize this from paddle wheels to aspirators to vertical pump aerators to airlifts. Uh, from the bottom or layer airlifts where you put air in uh, through the side and move it up. Or, I'm sorry, this is a submerged pump, this is an airlift. And I'm going to try to touch on each one of those for a uh, brief, brief moment. You know, how much oxygen is necessary? There's two approaches. Sometimes it's based on feeding. Dr. Claude Boyd is kind of the industry guru on oxygen uh, sediment water interface. He's from Auburn University. And he says that one pound of feed requires one pound of oxygen a day. Keeping in mind that fish can consume up to 13 times the amount of oxygen when their stomachs are full and also their activity as far as oxygen level increases tremendously when they're feeding. Okay, they're just, their metabolic activity sped up considerably. Average consumption method, so this is a number that we use when we're trying to size aeration. And, and you know, you're going to look at this and say, well, what does that mean to me? You know, it's just, it's, it means something to me if you come to me with a, with a fish pond, a fish tank or something, and, and we can say somewhere between 0 0.02 and 0 0.05 pounds of oxygen per hour per 100 pounds of fish, keeping in mind this statement down here. And everything is, every lake, every pond is different. They, they're like their own individual organism. Larry can tell you that those ponds in the hatchery, not any of them is exactly the same, even though they're exactly the same shape. As Gordy could tell you with the ponds that he has in, in uh, Northern Illinois. And so I'm just throwing out numbers that are generalities, but you see where fish are in terms of the amount of consumption that they're going to take in the pond. Plankton, you know, the plants that are in there is 50%. Sediment oxygen demand could be 30%. And fish in a pond might only be 20%. So it gets to be a little bit more complicated in terms of what you need to take, what you need to use to satisfy the oxygen requirements within a pond. So why aeration? You know, to increase fish growth, health, fish kills, reduce fish kills, you can control some algae that are in the ponds. You can um, get rid of the organic muck layer on the bottom. You can process nutrients and bind up some phosphorus. Uh, clarity can increase as well as uh, turbidity. Tur turbidity can decrease. Debris, trash, surface film, you know, you can push that stuff like pollen. You can push it to the edges of the pond and uh, it, it will be more aesthetically pleasing to look at at the very least and sometimes there's some oxygen demand associated with that. When you get it really covered sometimes there's not as good of oxygen transfer at the air water interface where the majority of the oxygen takes place outside of photosynthetic activity. Mosquito control, you know if you cause a current there are certain species of uh, mosquitoes that don't do well with current. The, one stage in their life cycle, they take a siphon and they hang at the surface tension. If you can break that surface tension, you can basically drown them because in that stage, they're air breathers. And so just, you know, that's why everyone says you don't want spare tires hanging around the backyard because they can get in there, they can breed, and there's no current in there, so they're going to breed and multiply. Yeah, so what aeration can do, it mixes to make it uniform top to bottom. Fish have access to the entire water column. The organic uh, stuff is going to be reduced and you can stimulate some beneficial bacteria within the pond. Th this is where the quiz will be at the end. You've got to memorize this chart here. Now, basically, it's just talking about, uh, you know, it, it, it's a cycle. You can just look at it. I'm not going to get into it. Um, 
the quick answer is to, to support aeration is you don't want to plant your fish. You, you want to basically harvest your fish. You know, unless, you, unless you're growing them for fertilizer. Yeah, pond aeration is two strategies. Feed the game. Aerate to get fish to harvest faster, shorten the risk. Aerate to increase density and more pounds per acre. This one is being studied quite extensively down in the, in the Mississippi Delta. And so what they're trying to do um, is uh, basically not stock as many fish, but feed them more, have, to have them get to harvest faster so that you reduce the risk as opposed to increasing densities when you have greater, um, um, greater aeration in your pond. You know, so oxygen transfer test, what does this mean? You know, it, it, this is the result, pounds of oxygen per, per horsepower per hour. But you can't really take that, as I said, and take it into a pond unless you know those other three demands. The demand of the sediment, the demand of the plankton, and the demand of the fish. But it's a good way to relatively compare one unit to another unit as far as manufacturers are concerned. You know, DO tips. So Les Torrens is from Stoneville, and he's saying that there's statistically valid information that they have through history, and they've been doing this for 30 some years down there, that they'd rather have oxygen levels that are not widely variable. And why they are widely var variable is that if you create a plankton bloom in your pond, and if you don't manage it correctly, via photosynthetic, photosynthetic activity at six o'clock in, in the evening, oxygen level is gonna be the greatest. But then, let's say it's a cloudy day or something, six o'clock in the morning when there's been no photosynthetic activity, it's gonna drop way down to a very low level. And the baby fish are the, are the ones that really have issues with that, that, that wide range of oxygen. It, it's better to have it more stable, and you can do that with aeration, and he's saying that you don't want it below three parts per million. This is channel catfish. And what does that mean, three parts per million? You know, we hear within the industry, we want oxygen levels to be five parts per million or greater, but they can get by with three down there. And the reason they're doing is that they, in some of these ponds, they have even eight horsepower per acre. So what they're trying to do is manage power. They're managing expenses. And, and if we look at expenses on a typical, fairly large facility, Labor is right up there, feed is right up there, and aeration is right up there. The three big money grabbers in any, any farm that is of any significant size. Now, if we're talking indoor, I would say that power is probably number one because of the recirculating nature of it, and there are some exceptions to that. Um, so, pure oxygen threshold. People have asked, you know, when do I go to pure oxygen? And somewhere around half a pound per gallon of fish per uh, half, half a pound of fish per gallon of water is where you can stick with uh, you know intensive recirculating systems, be it uh, a splasher, diffused air. But if you start to get above that, you just can't add enough, and the fish are going to become stressed. And that's when you would go to pure oxygen. And you just would introduce pure oxygen via a diffuser that sits in the tank bottom because if we think all bubbles they rise at roughly one foot per second. And so that oxygen is only in contact with the water for three seconds. It doesn't have the ability to transfer into the water. So the driving force in this situation has to be pressure. You have to put this oxygen into a cone of some type, pressurize it, and all gases follow the laws of partial pressure, meaning you put pressure on them, they're going to dissolve. Then you take that water and introduce it into the bottom of the tank, as opposed to diffusing pure oxygen via bubbles into the tank, and it'll be extremely more efficient than if you added oxygen via a diffuser in the, in the, in the tank or the pond bottom. So, in, I, I mentioned catfish, and I just throw this out here for, for um, uh, uh, an example. And they're, they're getting under two pounds of feed for every pound of growth with this type of strategy. They can get, in some of these ponds, 20,000 pounds per acre. Now that's unheard of up here. How they can do it is that typically they had 20 acre ponds. They've, now they put a berm in them, cut them in half, and I think I have a slide here to show this, yeah. So this used to be one big pond. They put this berm in here. And over here, there's nothing going on. They're not putting any fish here. They're just aerating this, they're spinning this and aerating over here, 
here's where the fish are. The fish are at 20,000 pounds per acre at harvest. So being able to do two things, they put more density in there and get fish up to market faster. You know, paddle wheels. You know, the, the, Better oxygen transfer than most any other sur surface area out there this style. And so this is a, a Taiwanese style. The, the problem, the differences between these two, these have spiraling blades that go all the way around it so that as it spins and it goes like this, there's a balance of, of blades that are back over here so you don't get like you would here, the kerplunk, 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 kerplunk. And eventually this gear reduction box where the motor's at is going to wear out because of that kerplunk, 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 where here it just spirals around and it balances each other out. The disadvantage to this one, as you can see, relates to size and that they don't make them relatively small. You know, the, the smallest I've seen is maybe about half horsepower, but it has a price tag of about 2,000 bucks. The, the advantage these have is that not only do they aerate, but they can cause directional flow. So you can point them and spin ponds around a little bit more effectively than you can some of the other aeration techniques. You know, surface air right? Or just, uh, I'm not going to give you the story here other than um, uh, there was a fish kill and put six of these in a 30 acre lake, save the fish, it's in the greater Chicago area. But uh, I think I have other slides to show that. Actually I have, a, if I, how can I, there's normally, a, I got a video here. I don't know if I can get it. They might know, sometimes they don't like to talk to each other. So this is, I'm not, I don't want to play this as a commercial. This is a trout farm in California. Right. My name is Carson Brown. This is a Wall Street facility, Mount Austin Trout Farm. Uh, this is our production facility. We produce around 280 to 290,000 pounds a year. Um, as you can see, these are our Pasco aerators. Uh, we use these because they're most cost effective. Uh, they produce the most amount of adult oxygen that we can find. They uh, turn on every time and they sink our, our fish more times than I, I can count. Stand up product for a great facility. You know, that, there's a little borderline commercial for Casco. That's not what I was trying to get across there. What I was trying to portray with this video and this image is these are relatively small raceways. That unit and others like it that aren't just made by us, but other people, they can physically move that over here if they have to. So they can move them around very easily. There's just a rope, a rope and a power cord that goes to shore. We'll see one operating out there. And so you might have oxygen demand in one pond for a certain reason, more fish feeding more. You can take it and move it over here. So you don't always necessarily have to have an aerator for every pond. If you notice over here, there's no aeration. It's just, there's one here, there's not one there. And how they get most of their oxygen is by simply flowing water through the facility. So you can run them in winter, but you better not turn them off. Because if you turn them off and try to turn them back on, the propeller is gonna be frozen in the water. The other thing is you are super cooling. As you're adding it to the air, anytime you see, see white, that means there's air, air water contact. And in doing so, you're gonna, there's gonna be a temperature drop in, in the water, and you would never want to turn them off. So if you're running them in winter, they're running all the time. You can do it, in this case, uh, these guys are trying to move CO2. They're actually using pure oxygen in these tanks, but CO2, carbon dioxide, is getting to a level in these tanks where it's too high, and because they, they can't agitate, they're not splashing it. So they, they splash it to cause the gas to escape, and I'll just say, in this case, you better make sure that you then vent it out of the building, because if you don't, it might diffuse back into that water. So you have to have some type of fan mechanism to do it. It's just two different methods of CO2 reduction. You know, surface aerators, you, know, you just cage culture. I, I, I've probably heard in my professional career 5,000 times, how should I get started? What species should I raise? And, you know, something as simple as, not of this magnitude, but a few cages. You think of it as um, they're all there. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to harvest them because they're all in this cage. And I can get my feet wet and really know what's going on here. Are they feeding? Are they not feeding? And at harvest, I can take them all out. The other thing is, if you have them highly concentrated in a small area like that, you're going to have to have some way of moving water through there so that we get oxygen through there, whether it's diffused air, surface aeration. These are net pens down in Chile where we, we have a blower in this building and there's diffusers. And this is 50 foot deep. So we're just lifting water from the bottom to the top. They're raising salmonids here. 
we're just moving water. So it's all about taking water that's got lower oxygen level and bringing better oxygen level in there. So it's circulation as much as it is aeration. You know, so regenerative blowers. These are um, high volume, low pressure. So you see these big pipes. Um, it, it, they can then put these to different air stones and suspend them in the water column or drop them down into the, on, the, on the bottom of the tank. Uh, so here, this pond wasn't uniform in, in depth. And if you don't have it uniform in depth, if you don't have a valve here, what the air will try to do is follow the path of least resistance. It'll go out the one line that's either closer or is shallower. So these are basically friction loss controllers or whatever you want to say. It's to equalize the pressure. And he suspended them all at 36 inches. That's just a gallon jug. And there's four nine inch air stones that are there suspended in this trout farm in Michigan. And it, it's worked very effectively for them. Here's another, another way that they've done it. So again, this is all blowers. This is a small air stone. It's roughly this size. And there's 25 of them that are suspended from this one inch pipe. What happens is that the air causes this thing to move a little. If you notice, it, when this photo was shot, all the bubbles are coming on this side. Well, it pushes it over here. And then when it gets taut, these stones go to this side, they push it in the other direction. If there was a disadvantage to this technique, if you're not on the pond on a, on a regular basis, some fish eating birds have a tendency to perch on this floating line. Someone told me they taste like chicken. I would not know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a different way of aerating. This is a, this is a air grid here and below there's a bunch of air stones and they're just they're just moving water just a different way of doing it different choices for stones you know so if you get into deeper ponds you can't go with a blower because they're pressure sensitive i like to say a blower is high in volume low in pressure a rock or a carbon vein compressor is just the opposite high in pressure and it, it doesn't have a, a, as much volume though but you can get deeper if you have a pond that's eight nine ten eleven foot deep this could be your choice because you can get deeper in. And so now we're not looking so much for the oxygen transfer from the bubbles as they rise in the water column. It's more a synergistic lifting effect, just moving water so that we can keep it uniform top to bottom in oxygen and temperature. You know, here's a different choice as well. These are rocking pistons, a little bit uh, advanced technology from the carbon veins. Carbon veins typically have been said to be screamers. They're a little bit louder. The disadvantage of these is they don't have quite the volume, but they can go really deep. They can go to 50 foot deep if you want. So they're quieter, they use less amp draw, there's not as much maintenance, they don't have quite um, the same volume, so that's a negative, but they lose, use a little bit less power than a, rock or a, a rotary vane would. And then linear compressors, one other choice, again, for air. These are, they, they kind of came from the koi industry, the backyard pond industry, but aquariums use them. You might be able to run on the biggest one, 25 aquarium air stones off of it. The advantage is they are virtually quiet. You cannot hear them. The disadvantage is they don't have great pressure, they don't have a lot of volume. But if you only want to aerate a small pond that's relatively shallow with a diffuser, this could be your choice. You know, so this is what I mean by a diffuser. I'm talking about the synergistic lifting effect. We'll see one of these out in the pond in a little bit. But at, this is independent third party tested. Two diffusers drawn, 2.5 amps. You can do the math on that, see what that means power wise. It's not very much. They will move 3,400 gallons per minute at 15 foot of depth. The deeper diffusers are, the more efficient they become because there's more hang time for the bubble and there's more ability to cause a synergistic lifting effect to basically entrain water into this diffuser and raise it up. As you see, this bubble, it's getting wider. And it's not about oxygen transfer from these bubbles, it's about moving water. It's significantly more effective, effective than if you try to put a motor um, a pump on there. But they gotta be deeper. If we take a look at these uh, project reports, I'm going to start with the one that's dated 2007. So what these are meant to do is kind of provide a, a basic overview of the, how we raise fish for a year, you know, from start to finish. And I think as other speakers have mentioned, and you guys have heard this over and over and over, it's, it's different for every facility. So not 
one facility or one pond is the same, you have to treat those differently. So you can't think that there's an easy cookbook that uh, will allow you to, you know, just put this much fertilizer in this pond and this much in this one and this and then just do the hokey pokey and voila, you raise fish. It's not that easy. Uh, raising fish in ponds is an art and the only way to, to get proficient at it is to do it and to be out there. So even to this day, um, I still take firsthand um, I'm on the ponds all the time working on them, mornings and nights and stuff. So I don't just leave that up to some inexperienced worker. I don't just say go do this. I'm out there taking care of it myself and uh, looking at the ponds and looking at the fish. And you got to keep that in mind as you go through this. So how many of you are going to maybe raise fish in ponds? A few of you. What species are we interested in? Perch and walleye. Perch and walleye. Trout. Trout, rainbow, Probably. and walleye. walleye. So um, different things, you know, if you're raising walleyes and perch in ponds compared to if you're raising trout in ponds, uh, a lot of different things are going to come into play. Uh, we've talked a lot about water quality and how water quality affects what you're raising and those different species, you know, trout are more susceptible to poor water quality, more so than walleyes and perch. They can handle it a lot better. In fact, that's one of the reasons that in some of our systems we use water that's slightly dirty or tannic or, or maybe has clay in it. The walleyes can handle it and the perch can handle it, but uh, the trout can't. So those things, have you have to be aware of that stuff. But So if you look at this report, and this walks through the whole thing, I just wanted to take a few minutes and kind of talk about them and show you some of the equipment we use and then I think Emma has a few videos of stuff in action and we're going to try to get out to the ponds if the rain holds off and, and do some stuff so you guys can get a feel for it and see how, how it works. Um, so for those of you who are up to NADF, just, uh, was that last month? Wow. My hell, time flies. And uh, we had eggs, walleye eggs in our jars and we had fish hatching. So you got to see the, the egg incubation stuff that's right on the front page. Um, this report's kind of old, it's 2007. So it's a little dated. You know, that's my uh, younger brother. Uh, this is before uh, the, uh, so. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not quite the Bob that Bob that you know, I still have my hair, but it's just a little different color now. Um, it's because of all the walleyes I've raised. So, so you saw those eggs in the incubation system, and we talked about that at the time. But so we're bringing in, uh, we go out and collect eggs from the wild. Uh, we fight net those fish or, or net those fish. We bring them into the facility and we hatch them in the incubation system. So all those eggs that you guys saw at NADF a month ago have already been raised up. Uh, they are an inch and a half long and we've actually concluded one aspect of our larval feed trial that was being done in those rooms. So in that month while everybody was off having fun, you know. Oh, fun. Yeah, we, we were cranking. So we, we did over 1.5 million walleyes and saw guys this year. Uh, we still have quite a few that we're raising, so there's still a little bit of pressure if my phone rings or goes off and I run away. That's, I'm not just running away because I don't like you guys. I'm running <laughs> away because I gotta go take care of stuff, so. Um, so those eggs hatch, we either put them out into the ponds where we feed them zooplankton. And so uh, one thing we didn't talk much about was treatment of eggs. And if you look at the next page, we talked, this report, we actually did a treatment because this was back when VHS was a big issue. So for those of you who are not aware of what VHS is, if you get into fish culture, you will become aware of it. Uh, it's a virus that affects fish, viral, viral hemorrhagic septicemia, something like that. Here goes with the, the, the yeah, the Archie. But we know what VHS is. It's not the big thing you plug in 
the, who, who remembers those? Yeah. Uh, I made that mistake the other day. Yeah. Does anybody have a record player? Yeah, a couple of, <laughs> right. I was thinking of going back to one. But uh, so we looked at treating eggs for VHS and we looked at three egg treatments. We had an untreated control. We treated some of the eggs with 100 parts per million iodine, which was milk mixed in when the eggs were being fertilized with the milk, uh, because there were some people that were saying, you know, it's, it could be in the egg. And you know, once the egg closes up after a short period of time, things don't get in there. But so we treated it with iodine during that process, that water hardening process, and then we also treated them after water hardening. And there was a difference. Um, we did find that you know, our untreated control was at 63%. Treating with iodine at the same time we added the milt, we only had 25% hatching percentage or hatching survival. And after water hardening, we actually had better. We had 75%. Um, I doubt if that was statistically different than the control, but uh, it's something to be aware of. And the 25% definitely was statistically different, and that's an issue. So if you are getting eggs from the DNR, and they're going to give you 40,000 eggs, and you need 30,000 fish, you don't want to treat them with iodine when they're being fertilized. Um, and that's actually a, it's an interesting point because different agencies have different ways of treating and different levels of treating and there are differences between those treatments and there's a lot of discussion about that. We found that treating after water hardening with iodine for 10 or even 15 minutes at 100 parts per million is okay and it doesn't seem to affect our success rate. So that's something to be aware of if you're getting eggs from somebody. Um, be aware of what you're going to start out with. So uh, with pond, this is a pond incubation workshop or pond incubation boot camp, right? Or pond incubation, pond boot camp. Oh boy, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it's been a long week. Uh, strong swimming fry that are three to five days old after they hatch, of course, they're stocked out into the pond. So Larry talked about this a little bit when we were out there. So we do the same thing, you know, most places that raise fish in ponds do the same thing. I don't, Gordy, when do you guys stock your fish or is it the in same? The yeah, when they, hatch. when they hatch. So same kind of deal. Um, you saw at our facility, we collect them in a tank. They're strong swimming. Larry had the same thing. He's got an upwelling tank where they come out of the jars and then they upwell. And then he puts a light over them and he, does, he collects them and then they stock them. And it's just, you know, a couple days after they hatch is pretty common. And then there's different densities of how many fish to stock into the ponds. And then there's literature out there to talk about how much to do. Or, and it, but it depends on your protocol, like what you're trying to get to at the end. If you stock less fry in the pond, generally those fry are going to be a little bit larger. Uh, quicker, right, because there's just less competition, less density, and you might, they might be a little bit more robust after 30 days to where if you have a lot of fry in there. But, you know, we've had some people that came to us and have said, you know, we don't care how, many, how big the fish are, we just want a lot of fish. So in that instance, I would overstock my ponds, maybe a little higher, get more fish rather than a bigger fish. So you got to think about what your product is and where you're headed. Um, a lot of times what we would do at NADF is we stock the ponds with fry, we raise those for 30 days and that's, and you're kind of, you're building your plankton levels with fertilizer uh, and you're, you're raising those fish for 30 days and after that 30 days the plankton kind of crashes and the fish are also looking for bigger particles so they're looking for something bigger to eat and they'll eat each other, or they'll eat coronamid larvae, or they might eat pinhead minnows. You know, you have to make a decision, and we've had people where they don't make that decision quick enough, and then those fish are gone. You don't have time to mess around. With VHS, if you're gonna move your fish around, you have to get them tested immediately as fry and then by the time the 30 days is up and they're ready to come out of the pond, your fish health sample is done. It's a 30-day test, pretty much. 
And uh, so if you don't, if you forget to send your fry in, all of a sudden you get to 30 days, you're ready to harvest your fish, but your disease sample's not done, you can't move your fish. They're done. Well, um, the DNR ran into this uh, a few times, both because of the, uh, the disease sampling and also they couldn't get minnows when they needed them. They couldn't get the pinhead minnows and they lost a lot of fish because of that. So all that work is just going down the drain, literally. So you gotta think about this stuff ahead of time. So in, you, in the labs, you have to set your disease sampling up ahead of time. You can't just call them and say, hey, I'm shipping fish tomorrow. They'll say, no, we're full, because everybody's doing it in the spring. So you gotta set things up ahead of time. So those are just little tricks and things. Um, we fertilize our ponds uh, with alfalfa meal and soybean meal. Uh, but generally we use alfalfa meal and so I talk about that in this report. It talks about starting out with 400 pounds of alfalfa meal and then we use 2.25 gallons of liquid 28% nitrogen urea and then one pound of granular phosphorus. Sometimes those things change like the inorganics. You can't always get what you want so you got to find what you can get and make it work. And um, so these are just examples of what we did and we tried to add some cost factors in here for that. So we would put fertilizer in the ponds before we add any water, and then we start to add a little bit of water. We put about a quarter of the pond, pond water in there. We let it warm up a little bit, probably about a week before we're gonna put fry in there. And some people were like, well, why don't you just fill it up right away? Well, we have a problem in Northern Wisconsin is that our water is cold and if we don't get warm weather for a while so we want the sun to bake that shallow water and, and heat it up and get that plankton get that bloom going but if you don't time it right if you do it too soon you will the plankton so larry i think was talking about the size of the plankton and you know wanting the rotifers and then the copepods and then the daphnia so what happens is if you start too soon say oh well, i'm gonna i'm gonna start four weeks in advance to make sure I have a lot of food out there. The problem is your food outgrows your fish and the fish can't eat what you provide them. And the other issue is you get aquatic insects in there and they will hammer your fish. So all those cute little water boatmen and I don't know, those dragonfly nymphs and all the weird crap we pull out of our ponds. <laughs> we get some, the Stevens Point students come and collect uh, their aquatic uh, insect species out of our ponds every summer, it seems like our interns, they always get some weird stuff. So those things are gonna eat your fry. Um, even ducks, uh, mallards will eat fry uh, when, they're, when you first put them in. They don't generally keep going after them, but they will eat them because they're opportunistic feeders. So you gotta be aware of all these things. And so timing is important. And so I talked about pond, management being an art, and this is where the art comes in. It's not, honestly, raising rainbow trout in a, a raceway or in a tank for me, I mean, it's simple. It's like raising pigs. And uh, I never raised pigs before though, so. But uh, <laughs> it, it's a real scientific thing and it's really simple compared to pond, uh, pond raising. Um, there's so many variables and the weather, so when you're gonna fertilize, like Larry talked about the weather, about fertilizing around the weather, like probably wouldn't fertilize today because you got these weather things coming through, but my fish need feed, what do I do? You know, you gotta figure out ways around all this. But, so we stock our ponds with a little bit of fertilizer, get them kind of jump started. We add a little bit of water and then we slowly start adding more water. So this talks about that, these kind of go through what we did and um, talks about providing aeration, aeration and, uh, and then as we get to the end, uh, talks about some of our results. And so it's just, I think this report is a pretty good overall view of what's going on in the ponds. And it gives you guys some good information on, on what to look for. We talk about monitoring for temperature, oxygen, pH, and sessi disc readings. And at the back, we have all those displayed for each pond. And you can kind of 
walk through that stuff. Excuse me. And so what we typically would do is we raise our fish, our small fingerlings, for 30 days. We then harvest those fish. And for, at NADF, we get an exact total harvest. So we draw them all the way down because we have ponds with kettles. So if you guys were out there, you saw the pond and then it drains into a kettle or a, a collecting basin. Larry has that in his ponds too. We might get to see that here in a little bit. And um, it really works well for uh, collecting the small fish. We've noticed that instead of pulling a seine through the pond, it doesn't seem to cause as much stress and it's less stress on the fish and it's less stress on workers. Um, and if you harvest walleyes, think about when that 30 days is. Like for Larry, it's gonna be in another two weeks. I think he'll be 30 days and it's gonna be hot. Oxygen's gonna be low, sun's gonna be high. You're pulling, and if you sane those fish, those fish are gonna get stressed. And they get a thing called whitetail. And whitetail, once, it, once they have it, they're done. They're finished. You know, they'll never get, they'll never recover from whitetail. And that's another big issue with harvesting fish out of ponds. And, you know, we've had groups tell us, you know, they, they would pull all their fish up into the shallow end of the pond because that's where it's easy to work. It's also where the worst oxygen is, the worst water quality, the hot sun, the birds, everything. And then they wonder why their fish die. And so that's, those are poor decisions. That's a management decision, you know, don't do that. And uh, you want to maintain good oxygen, good water temperature, a lot of water exchanges, and take care of those fish. You put a lot of time and effort into raising them and getting them that far. Don't shortcome it. You know, on days when we harvest and stuff, we come in early. Sometimes we stay late. We don't always work in the middle of the day, or maybe we put a tarp up to block the sun. Um, you think about all those things. and that leads to success. If you skip corners and miss those little things, that's what, what causes problems. Um, so looking at this report, we would harvest those fish after 30 days. We get a total amount of survival of those small fingerlings. And so from an egg to a fry, we expect to see about 65% at NADF. If we do better than that, that's great. If we do worse than that, well, it's kind of a bummer. But 65% is kind of our long-term average. Sometimes we see higher, higher numbers, sometimes we see lower. But that's kind of a realistic number to shoot for. And I was talking about this earlier, you know, you talk to some of the hatchery managers around the state or around the, and you'll ask them, well, how, you know, what's your survival? And they'll be like, oh, we got 95%. And I'll be like, really, show that to me. I'd like to see it. Because I guarantee you they're lying to you. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, and it's really funny. I had a private guy who was a big fish farmer and uh, very knowledgeable and been at it a long time. He asked me one day, he says, well, what's your success rate at NADF on walleyes? And I said, 65%. And he said, thanks for giving me an honest answer. <laughs> and, because he said the same thing. So 65% is a good number. I mean, you can do better, you can do worse. But so then we, from a fingerling, so we would put the fry, excuse me, from a fry to a fingerling, we again are looking for 65%. And I think, and this year, I was looking at my results. We had one pond that got like 79% and a different pond that only did like 56% or something, or 40%. You know, but the average for all the ponds kind of comes out to that 60, 65%, somewhere in there. But it, the ponds are gonna be different. We have one pond that consistently outperforms the other ponds on either side of it. I don't know why. We treat them the right way, I mean, we're careful with them, and we watch them, and we give them what they need, and it still just seems to outproduce other ponds. So, after 30 days, we would pull those little fingerlings out, carefully count them, and enumerate them, come up with our numbers, and then from there, we split them up, and some of those fish would go back to our cooperators, like if we're working with maybe Red Cliff or Le Couture, and they would get stocked back into the waters, but then the other ones go back into a pond, 
and we would put minnows on top of those at that point because after 30 days they want something bigger and they want something else and walleyes are piscivores so they want fish so we give them pinheads like Larry talked about and we buy pinheads from Arkansas via a Wisconsin fish farmer and they're totally health certified and they bring them up and they're they're really cheap right anybody listen <laughs> yeah so we'll spend about ten thousand dollars on minnows to feed walleyes and it's a huge part of the cost to raise the fish um, but you start with these little pinheads you get a load of toughies they're called they're they're little tiny little minnows number ones and number twos and you do a couple weeks of those and then you switch to a normal size fathead and then you can raise your fish out to get a, a walleye like that so you're looking at a six to eight inch walleye that's what the state wants a minimum of six inches so if you're going to do any cooperative work with the state the average has to be six inches and um, you you get those on minnows in the pond and then so like Larry mentioned the rate of stocking minnows to pot to the fish so think about all this you know you got to order all this stuff ahead of time too so you can't just wait and say oh yeah bring me bring me 500 gallons of minnows tomorrow your order has to be placed like in December for June and uh, so you kind of kind of know what you're doing a little bit and got to figure this stuff out ahead of time and then you better hope that you're able to raise those fish at the rate you think and you hope mother nature's cooperating i mean this year we got a wrench thrown in because things got delayed we were delayed by several weeks and so it changes the whole schedule um, i mean think about i know when we originally looked at the schedule for boot camp we were like oh this week looks really good there shouldn't be any any anything going on well the last couple days we had to harvest our fish out of our indoor tanks and get those measurements off of them because they were ready to go and they don't care that we have boot camp scheduled <laughs> so um, and the same thing so you think about this stuff down the road and ordering minnows um, arranging for fish hauling and getting fish stocked or, or moved around all that has to happen in advance and um, so ordering forage minnows, like Larry was saying, I think he mentioned the ratio of five to one. Uh, I have listed four to one in this, and then sometimes I throw out the number of six to one. So between four to six to one, so that's four to six pounds of forage for one pound of walleye. And those minnows are expensive. So you really don't wanna buy more. So we talked about maybe going, why don't you just do eight to one? Problem is, is you spend all that money on them walleyes and they just keep eating and eating, kind of like we did with that fry bread, you know? And uh, they don't really realize they're already satiated and they're not gonna grow anymore. They've eaten as much fry bread as they can eat, but they'll want more, they'll just keep eating it. And uh, so you wanna mim minimize how much forage you provide to the fish, but you wanna hit your target goal. So that's where we're sampling those fish regularly. So we're sampling every few weeks in the ponds. We are using a seine to sample, but we do that carefully. And uh, again, you, you got to manage for water quality throughout that whole process. Um, so at the end of this, we harvested, so we backstocked these small fingerlings into a pond. We stocked 11,686 in one pond and 16,696 into another pond. And then at the end of that, we pulled out uh, about 9,606 extended growth walleyes. And I think the total, so survival for us this year was 34%. And uh, so it's not the 65 I want to see, it's not the higher percentage, but stuff happens but we did pull out some really nice fish uh, we actually learned that we had to hold the fish longer in the pond and what we found is that like every week you hold them longer at a certain point and if you're not providing enough forage they just decrease I mean they eat each other and and we found that if you held them we had to hold them like two or three weeks longer that we didn't plan on so we had no more forage and we went back in and a bunch of those fish were gone and so actually the next year we did a study and we 
we, in 2008, we raised uh, quite a bit more fish by harvesting them a few weeks earlier. So just those little changes like that. So, so the total cost this year to raise these fish, it was, we had $16,000 invested in those fish. That doesn't include the capital cost at NADF and you know the ponds and stuff. That's just running those ponds. That's all that is. No labor was included because we use interns. And, uh, <laughs> and so that, that was like the fertilizer, the forage, the fish health testing, and maybe a few miscellaneous expenses. So those fish were $1.68 per fish. And I think the DNR was paying $1.75 per fish with the walleye initiative. I so I don't know if they, have they increased their price? Do you know? No, I don't. So, so it's critical to find out what they're going to pay you for those fish. And Larry has some of that information too. So I actually, I know he said he ran into an issue, I think last year or the year before, they didn't pay him as much as they said they were going to pay him. And he ended up was losing money. So, um, so the extended growth walleye were held for a longer period of time, and this caused an increase in cost of approximately $4,000 because of additional VHS testing and minnow feed, which may also have reduced fish numbers in ponds due to cannibalism. Haha. -ha. So, so that's that report. I'm not going to go into the other one as much, but it, I wanted to go through that. So for advanced growth walleyes, if you're thinking about doing advanced growth walleyes, it can be done. We know how to do it. It can be done successfully, but there's a cost to that, and you got to be aware of what that cost is, and um, make sure that you're uh, able to get paid more than that. Last year, uh, we have another report that you guys have a copy of. It's a 2017. We did not do advanced growth walleyes. We only did little ones in the ponds. So I think Emma put this one together. And it's got a lot of good information again about what we did and how we did it. It talks about all the different fertilizers. It talks about egg quality and incubation. And we had a couple different groups of eggs that we used. So we were working in cooperation with the Red Cliff Tribe last year. And so our fertilization schedule is listed in here as well. So it starts out with 400 pounds of alfalfa meal and then some urea, and then it has a weekly amount that we add, but that's based on the ponds. And there's some interesting, another interesting graph about the pond temperature and the oxygen. And the sun. And the sun down below. So we actually, yeah, you plotted that, right? Mm -hmm. And that was, so last year was a difficult year for us because of the weather, again. Um, we didn't have very many nice days and the fish growth was reflected in that. Uh, but with all those, oh, I think this is a good picture too. This is a plankton picture that's in there. So we would harvest or, or monitor the ponds with a plankton net. And so I, every day or periodically, every couple days, we go out and do a plankton sample. And I think you ha might have some videos on that. So this is one type of a plankton net. So you throw a rope on it and put a rock in the thing here and then it'll sink and you can throw it out into the pond. And we do plankton toes uh, from the same spot, the same way, like the same length and stuff every couple days. And then we look at that plankton sample and you know we want to see stuff like that where that under a scope it's full of plankton. And it's also we want to verify the sizes to get the right uh, the sizes again for the fish. So that's that piece of equipment. The other thing we're checking is the sashi disc. So that's a sashi disc. If you guys have seen one of those before. And um, that's just lowered down into the pond. What we'll do is we'll mark this rope with uh, designations of uh, how far into the pond it goes. And we measure that every day. Uh, just like we measure pH, water temperature, and oxygen. And that's recorded every day. And if, like Larry said, it starts to clear up, then we would change and add 
a lot more, uh, we'd add fertilizer to that pond. Do you want to show so, a video? Yeah, what time is it? Can we? It's, we got to get going pretty quick. I took enough time. Okay. Uh, but if you want to show a video or two, well, you can, since you got it up. I, I just put this together just in case we didn't have enough time to see this outside, but um, I was just going through our steps on how we basically from egg to hatching to stocking in the pond. So this is kind of what Greg already talked about. Um, I, for those of you that were up at the facility, we did a little egg displacement activity. So we do quantify how many eggs we start with, how many fry we start with. So I just, I'll send you guys this too, but we figure out how many, you know, what, a, what is our fertilization success, and we figure out how many eggs we have to start with. Sorry, I'm just going to go through this quick to show you some videos. So this are fertilized eggs versus unfertilized. You can see the, they'll appear white to your naked eye, but when you put them under a scope, they'll appear black. So those are the unfertilized eggs and the ones that are developing. So these tell. are un unfertilized? These are fertilized, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, temperature units I go through in this PowerPoint, but you have that in your PDF um, and a file on your zip drive. But basically, we can manipulate the temperature to get walleye to hatch earlier. Um, it's just a standardized way to understand how long it's going to take, basically, different species to hatch out. Um, going through a little bit of fertilization. And this is our schedule that Greg already talked about. So I have a video on um, kind of how do we distribute fertilizer. So this is urea. This is Brittany. She's kind of throwing out, this is a solution, so this is our urea and phosphorus you throw out the ponds. This is a video of Jim putting um, the alfalfa meal into the pond, so it's very powdery, right? You have to make sure you know which way the wind is blowing. It really helps out, <laughs> but you want it to spread. You put it on one side and the wind will pull that, um, kind of, it floats along the top of the water, so you want it to pull across the rest of the pond. And you can always tell who the rookies are. <laughs> Because <laughs> they come back and they're all green. Yeah, we want to fertilize on a, base, on a sunny day so that you know, we're utilizing photosynthesis, that phytoplankton are using those fertilizers. Uh, this is Sam Temple, one of our last interns using the plankton net. So basically you throw it in. We do three toes um, just because that's our pond. We can kind of understand you know, the length of the of the rope there, and then we can kind of basically understand how many zooplankton are in that area of space. It wasn't a very good demonstration. No, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see who can be the best plankton thrower. Yeah. So unfortunately, there's a lot of ostracods or clam shrimp in that pond, so it's pretty, it was pretty turbid because of the clay, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But we had a ton of clam shrimp in that last pond. Uh, this is that sushi disc here. So again, you're lowering it down, and when the coloration, but you can't tell from black to white, that's how, that's the depth of your your turbidity. And we want to stay with that foot, right? Is that that's what our yeah, that's what we stay. We do. That's for a while, like Yeah. And yep. That's for yeah. That's so if you have a clear pond, like Larry said, that's dangerous. That means you don't really have a lot of phytoplankton, not a lot of production. Your walleye are going to be cannibalizing more. There's just less less in that pond. Um, sorry. So this again, the light up against the tank, we're getting that strong swimming fry right when they hatch out. So these are three to five day old fry. Sorry, you can't. Do you want to flip the lights actually? Sorry. Um, this is our larval, gym sort of larval counter. So we're pouring those strong swimming fry into that larval counter. And there's little tubes that the fry go into. And there's kind of a light that is counting each and every fry. So you can see when it lights up like that, it's counting every fry. So we're getting a really good number of fry. We know exactly what's going into those ponds. Unlike Larry, he's doing a volumetric kind of displacement with those fry. It can be, you know, off here and there. We get, I think we stock anywhere from 80 to 100,000. Into the ponds? Into yeah, it just, just depends on when what the guys, management goal is. When you guys do that volumetric thing, um, like we were counting out the babies, um, 
For eggs, yeah. So those fish are going to be all dead, right? They're going to be... The eggs? How else, how else would you count them? I mean, right? When you count them? When uh, we're doing... Um, I was talking about fry. The fry? After they pass. No, they're still alive. So you would mix up like a bucket of water and then take a random sample and you count how many are in 10 milliliters. And then you'd say, okay, if 10 fryer and 10 milliliters, how many fryer in the amount? Then you would extrapolate that, that out to your, to, your volume, to your total volume. Yeah. You could kill those ones in that little milliliter thing if you wanted to make it easier. But we usually count them. They're swimming around. They just net them out. So. Yeah. And then when we're stocking fry, we want to be tempering them. So we want to make sure that they're used to the water temperature that they're going into. Um, so we're managing that. We want to make sure that our plankton numbers are, sorry, the video's not, let's see very good, that we have high plankton levels before we put them in the ponds, but we want to make sure that the ponds are good oxygenated, probably on a cooler day. This yeah. is in probably May. Yeah, this is, so we're actually adding water right here, right? But we're adding fry too. Um, and I don't know if this pond was too hot or something, or if we we're just trying to start to get the level up a little bit. Um, but that's in the summertime, we'll add cold water when it gets really hot. So Bob Robinson was talking about how the, the windmills don't work when you need them because it gets hot and it's still. And the water actually, we'll get a, a layers, the water will stratify in our ponds. So we use aeration to keep it stirred up, but we run our aerator at night. We don't run it in the day because if you run it in the day, it'll superheat the whole pond. So we only run it at night on timers. And then we add cold water to build up a layer of cold, cold water that's highly oxygenated so it's there for the fish. And then at night, you know, that all gets mixed back up. And that allows us to get through those hot summer months of August. And